Hello everybody, welcome to this introduction and discussion of Song When I Am Dead, My Dearest by Christina Rossetti. Christina Rossetti wrote Song When I Am Dead, My Dearest when still a teenager. It's one of the youngest written poems in the collection, uh, written in 1862. Um, and is often offered as a partner poem to um, the work that we looked at in the last video, which was the poem Remember. These two are both kind of sister poems in some way, for reasons that you'll soon see, if you don't know already. Without further ado, let me read it for you, and we'll have a closer look. Song When I Am Dead, My Dearest, by Christina Rossetti. When I am dead, my dearest, Sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, nor shady cypress tree. Be the green grass above me, with showers and dewdrops wet. And if thou wilt, remember. And if thou wilt, forget. I shall not see the shadows. I shall not feel the rain. I shall not hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain. And dreaming through the twilight that doth not rise or set, Happily I may remember, and happily may forget. As with many of the other works that we've seen in the collection, uh, there's a very defined tone in this poem, almost a personality um, from this first person speaker. Um, let's have a look at the way the poem is put together. Uh, and then we'll drill in a bit deeper and find out what some of the imagery might be suggesting. We have two clear octaves. When I am dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, nor shady cypress tree. And you can hear the ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tums that we are now familiar with as being an iambic rhythm. Um, it does trip or deliberately stumble a couple of times and we'll we'll look at those instances in a moment uh, but also let's check the rhyme scheme whilst we're looking at structure dearest me head tree me wet remember forget so not some of the most regular and obvious rhyme schemes of poems that we've looked at recently but there is definitely some end rhyme going on um, if we try and rhyme scheme this we've got dearest me head tree me, wet, remember, forget. So not, a, not an obvious rhyme scheme, but one in which rhyming words do jump out sonically and create pairs with one another, creating connections between specific words that rhyme. Um, it is rhythmic, um, and the rhythm with the rhymes that, such as they are give it a song-like quality, and the iambic pattern give it a song-like quality which um, obviously is reflected in, in the title of the poem. So what is she saying? When I am dead my dearest sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head nor shady cypress tree. It seems to be being addressed to somebody left behind when uh, looking forward or looking ahead to the point at which the speaker is dead, in, uh, at which she's no more. We don't know who that listener is. Uh, we don't know if it's a man or a close member of the family. She's very young at this point, so in some senses it might be more likely to be a close member of the family. But even at a young age, she's very clearly anticipating the point of her death. It's when I am dead, not if I die, but when I am dead. There's a certainty there, which is perhaps unusual um, to one so young. Um, even one writing during a period where, as we've said before, there was a a real fascination with the um, process of mourning and the mystery of death and some superstitious beliefs and some religious beliefs that, that corresponded to death and the afterlife. So she's anticipating the point after she dies um, and addressing the person left behind with a set of instructions for how she wishes to be remembered slash not remembered. When I am dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. We've got lots of repeated uh, consonant sounds with the double Ds in the first line and then the sibilance of the S's in the second line. Sing no sad songs for me. 
it almost emphasizes the the sing-song nature of of the rhythm um, those sibilant s's in line two plant thou no roses at my head nor shady cypress tree the first four lines the first almost quatrain of that octave um, has that very familiar sing-song a b c b rhyme scheme plant thou no roses at my head nor shady cypress tree so lines three and four introduce the first of two natural um, images or, or um, allusions we've got the reference to roses in line three which as 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 you'll know normally has connotations of kind of romance um, she wants no thoughts of love um, at that point once she's dead and also the shady cypress tree so shady um, in this sense is kind of uh, cool and comforting but uh, a cypress was for the pre-raphaelites and before often associated with death or or grave sides or, or mourning it's an evergreen tree so there's there was an image of the cypress as being something that would would go on after you died but she doesn't want that she doesn't want to be remembered symbolically by that um, cypress tree instead we have the imperative instruction b the green grass above me again a repeated consonant sound with showers and dewdrops wet and if thou wilt remember and if thou wilt forget the drops of water that she's asking for are not significantly tears shed as perhaps would have been more, um, more typical of a, of, of a Victorian piece or of sentimentality around death this is quite unsentimental this is not I don't want drops from your eyes give me give me drops from from the sky give me natural dewdrops or raindrops uh, showers and dew, dew drops wet and if thou wilt remember and if thou wilt forget so a tone very much of a kind of acceptance either way almost a resigned tone there's a some of you have, have pointed out that there's a tone of the noun for resigned is resignation there's a tone of resignation but it's quite a, a light resignation it's not um, the weariness that we see in From the Antique, for instance. This is a much more at peace kind of resignation, perhaps. We've got the more intimate form of you here, which is thou. This is this is a, um, a very informal and intimate word um, that again establishes the listener as being somebody close to the speaker. I shall not see the shadows. I shall not feel the rain. I shall not hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain. So the repetition of I shall not, that trio, um, and then that uh, A, B, C, B rhyme scheme that we've noticed in stanza one is repeated again, which again really emphasizes sonically the, the, the sing song nature of the, the structure. Um, I shall not see the shadows. I shall not feel the rain. I shall not hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain. So why are these three images in this trio why are they linked together well arguably shadows and rain are sort of the slightly darker or more um, depressing if you like images um, of graveside mourning she doesn't want shadows nothing gothic please she doesn't want rain she doesn't want that pathetic fallacy of, of the the rainstorm at the graveside and she does not want to hear the um, nightingale or she won't hear the nightingale the nightingale being a bird that has mythical associations from the story of Philomela who you can look up P-H-I-L-O-M-E-L-A Philomela um, and Philomela it comes from a Greek myth that was like many Greek myths retold by the great Roman storyteller Ovid um, and one of those stories that comes from the Metamorphosis which I heartily recommend it lots of our stories cultural stories where people are changed from one thing into another um, often can be traced back to the myths and 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 tales of Ovid and if you're looking for a good um, translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis then I recommend the Ted Hughes version because although Ovid is a Roman poet uh, writer who uses obviously Latin and Latinate language um, I think the translations into um, the more Anglo-Saxon type of English that Ted Hughes uses really suits the full-on physicality of the stories that Ovid tells. Um, much more crunchy kind of prose, much more monosyllabic, tough, hard kind of prose, which really suits it. I'm getting sidetracked, I'm aware of that. Um, but uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis is where you will find the story of Philomela. Um, there are other sources too, but this is one of them. Um, Philomela was turned into a nightingale after something that 
something very awful that happened to her. You must read the story if you want to know what happened to her. If you know anything about Ovid and Metamorphosis, you'll know it'll be pretty ghastly. But she was turned into a nightingale, and so the beautiful plaintive song of the nightingale, which was such a favourite um, with the romantic poets, um, has got a pain in it because she's singing. The beauty of her, uh, of her singing belies the pain that is behind the fact that this was a girl that's transformed into a nightingale. So three quite dark images in a way. Um, but the speaker is not going to be aware of any of it. I shan't see the shadows, I won't see the rain, I won't hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain. And I think this uh, as if in pain here is, is almost uh, Rossetti being really pragmatic or, or down to earth. It's like this, this is a nightingale, this is not actually singing in pain, it's singing as if in pain. And pointing that out, I think, at this point in the poem just emphasises the down to earthness of this attitude. It's the opposite of any superstition around the afterlife. Um, this is really that kind of I'm going to be in the ground, I'm not going to know what's going on kind of attitude that we've seen in one or two other places um, when Rossetti talks about death. And dreaming through the twilight that doth not rise or set, happily I may remember and happily may forget. Now there's an interesting bit of context here. Um, sorry, a bit awkward to get to. This idea of death being a dream state. Rossetti, as you might know from your reading, had particular ideas about what death was. Um, and it wasn't the predictable, or perhaps not predictable once you've read poems like this, it wasn't the predictable Christian version of afterlife. It was a particular version of death that was a belief held by a certain tranche of Christians. Um, it'd be worth looking up and, and reading a little bit more about that. It's more, uh, there's more detail to it than I'm going to go into here, but um, have a read. It's interesting. So that idea of dreaming through the twilight, it, on first reading, it's a little confusing because if you're dead, you're not dreaming, especially if you're the kind of dead that stanza one and, and part of stanza two suggests you're not aware. Um, this version of death isn't aware of life going on without you. So why dreaming? Well, it's to do with this particular doctrinal interpretation of death that, that corresponds to Rossetti's beliefs. Happily I may remember and happily may forget. So this word happily um, can be sort of translated as a, um, a truncated version of happily or as a way of writing perhaps um, as an adverb. Does that make sense? Perhaps perhapsly I may remember and perhaps I may forget so you'll have your own reading of that perhaps it can be read either way and your your reading will suggest one rather than the other one happily suggesting a complete lack of any sadness or attachment to uh, what's going on back on earth or in life and the perhaps interpretation of happily um, a much more kind of who knows kind of uh, kind of tone so you'll decide which uh, you prefer which which sums up you think well, what you think her tone or her intent is in saying these things so we've got a couplet at the end of each of these octaves and I think one uh, the second one very much reflects the first we've got remember and forget uh, mirroring each other at the end of each of these verses um, and whereas stanza one is talking about the listener, and if you, and if you, if you're going to remember, and if you want to forget, doesn't matter. And then at the end of the second stanza, it's about the speaker. So there's a there's a there's an inversion there, um, but very much a, a mirroring of 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 cadence and and also language between the ends of the first two stanzas. Now some critics have looked at this poem through um, a feminist lens uh, and obviously we have to be careful looking at Rossetti through a feminist lens and we must be careful using the word feminist about Rossetti because this is certainly not a word that she would have used it wasn't a word that was used at all at the point or at all for her at the point that she's writing and we know from our context research that um, we can't label her a feminist or or make any lazy assumptions about what that meant she believed. In many ways, her views and her beliefs were aligned with, with quite traditional Victorian views of womanhood. But every now and again, we hear 
a different note from her. And I think there's a, there's a sense of independence in this voice that is completely ready to be at peace or contented with or without the mourning tears or, or longing grief of a loved one. Um, it's a, a, an independence that now we recognise as being um, a feminist sentiment. You'll have your own ideas about what Rossetti's intent was with that tone. So I hope that you've been making connections between at least one other poem as you've been looking at this one. And as you annotate your own copy, uh, you might want to make some cross-reference notes between this and certainly remember, but almost definitely other poems in the collection too. It's another nice one to learn by heart because of that regularity uh, and the fact that it is a song should make it something that's easier to learn. So Song When I Am Dead, My Dearest by Christina Rossetti. I hope you enjoyed it. All the best.